Have you ever got annoyed by certain sounds, such as a baby crying, chewing gums, typing and clicking mouse, or just someone breathing? If that's the case, you might have misophonia. But wait a minute, what exactly is misophonia? Today, we are going to discuss this condition and reveal the science behind it with Dr. Jane Gregory from the University of Oxford and Dr. Celia Vitorotou from King's College London. Hi, I'm Jane Gregory. I'm a clinical psychologist and I'm researching misophonia at the University of Oxford. My name is Silvia Vitoratu. I'm a senior lecturer in psychometrics and I lead the psychometrics and measurement lab at the biostatistics and health informatics uh, department, IOPP and King's College London. Misophonia is a, an extreme or intense reaction to certain repetitive sounds and those sounds can be um, the, the sort of main, three main groups of sounds are eating sounds, uh, nose and throat sounds, so heavy breathing, coughing, that kind of thing, and then repetitive environmental sounds, which includes things like uh, keyboards tapping, clocks ticking, rustling papers, that kind of thing. And the reaction can be, it's often a really strong emotional reaction, but it can also be a physical sort of tension, physical reaction or a pain reaction or it can be um, a, a behavior reaction. So sort of an outburst or aggressive reaction. Um, it has just been recognized by a panel of experts as a disorder. And they, they felt that the intensity of the distress that it can cause and the impact that it can have on people's lives meant that it should be recognized as a disorder to uh, help understand the seriousness of this um, for some people. But of course, it's on a spectrum. So some people might have a, a very mild version of it and other people might find that they can't have relationships, they can't eat with their families, they can't concentrate enough in an office environment so they're unable to or, or really um, challenged in the work environment. So the general consensus is that it should be considered a disorder basically what drew me to doing the research in the first place was that I'd had this thing that I thought was just me being a little bit snobby or intolerant and actually it turns out that there's some um, mechanics behind it that helps to explain it so I remember one time when I was a kid I was 10 years old I was on a beautiful family holiday and my brother was eating this donut right next to me and refused to eat with his mouth closed felt like he was eating so loudly and so I literally got so angry that I grabbed the donut out of his hand and threw it in the bin and then was completely shocked with myself because I was such a um, normally kind and gentle person. And I just felt like I'd like changed personalities temporarily in that moment. I personally feel my personality changed in seconds. I feel I really have to leave the room straight away or I have to tell them, can you please stop uh, do that? Because as uh, Jane explained, sometimes it feels like people do it on purpose to hurt you. That's how you perceive it, even though, of course, that's not the case at all. And you, um, at the same time, know that this is not uh, true. Uh, it also depends a little bit uh, on the source of the sound. Um, I'll tell you a, a small uh, story as well. Uh, recently, three years ago, I had a baby. And at some point, once she was one, um, and, you know, babies make sounds, but they don't really, her sounds don't really affect me, which is very fortunate. Um, my, one of my biggest triggers, and I think, Jane, that's quite often the case, is my partner. So it's often people who live with you and people who are very close to you that uh, can be, um, uh, that can act as uh, triggers. So, it was this uh, nice day, I was doing something, I don't remember, and at the back of my head I heard my partner eating, making this awful, awful, awful sound, um, uh, at least um, the way I, uh, I experienced it. So I got this uh, response, the misophonic response, I turned my head to look at him, and it was the baby. And all the emotional response just went away in seconds, and that was very puzzling for me. 
So why, when I thought that it was one person making the sound or another person making the sound, changed the emotional response? And this is something that we had planned to do research before the virus. I'm a clinical psychologist by background. And so uh, what we're doing at the University of Oxford is uh, I'm trying to understand what are the aspects of misophonia that might be able to be changed with the help of therapy. And that what uh, Celia was talking about, about um, sometimes the reaction is not just about the specific sound, but maybe about the specific person or what else is going on in that moment. The fact that we know that it's not just the sound itself, that two different people could be making the exact same sound, or you can think one person's making the sound and it turns out it's a different person and you get a completely different emotional reaction. We know therefore that there are psychological elements to it. And that's the bit that we're trying to address with therapy. So I, I do cognitive behavior therapy and that's really trying to tackle that part where it feels like something is happening, even though you could see rationally, if you weren't in the moment, that that's not actually what's happening. So if it feels like someone's doing it deliberately to hurt you or trying to ruin your meal or trying to upset you and it, it's not rational um, but it feels true in your body that's the bit that we try and target with therapy and the idea is that we can bring down the intensity of the reaction if you can change that element of misophonia but we don't think that there's a complete cure one theory is that there's a, a sound a sensory processing part of this so basically our brains just can't ignore repetitive sound so normally when you hear a repetitive sound your brain registers it and then when it keeps going your brain just goes oh that's fine it's the same sound I don't need to keep listening to it but for some reason some people's brains don't filter out those sounds and we think that that's maybe an adaptive thing that for some of us to for sort of group survival for some of us to be able to not ignore those sounds might have helped to protect us from predators or kind of like the meerkats at the top of the hill that won't ignore the rustling in the grass while the other meerkats are safe to forage and look after the babies and that it, like the global pandemic is a really good example of that that people with misophonia are the ones who are not going to um, ignore the person with a repetitive cough at the back of the bus and obviously if there's nothing actually harmful happening then that's not so helpful because it stops you from being able to relax from being able to concentrate and yet there are times where it could be helpful so if someone's following you home for example and you pick up that there's footsteps and you might notice that the footsteps are getting quicker and therefore you know they're getting closer then that's part of survival so that's actually a really useful function or if someone's coughing you know that um that they might be ill and so you can protect yourself from illness so the problem really is not the fact that we um process the sounds this way it's the intensity of the reaction around those sounds and that's the bit that we're trying to change with psychological therapy and then audiologists are sometimes um, have what we call sound generators which is a little bit like a hearing aid which can play a, a sound in your ear that helps to mask the sounds that might help people to be able to concentrate or relax better around certain sounds and other than that it's mainly just trying to figure out how to um, adjust your life in a way that means that you don't that the sounds don't impact your life as much so it might be things like having music on at the dinner table so that you can enjoy time with your family or in my case I wear earplugs when I go to sleep so that I don't get disturbed in the night by small sounds because I will wake up really easily. So you can see that misophonia is largely unexplored and it's quite puzzling in so many different ways especially for those who uh, experience it and um, I was one of those who didn't have any kind of training. I'm a statistician, I'm a psychologist, I had no idea. Uh, I'm, I was one of those people that never had the term, even though I had um, uh, the uh, symptoms. And I was very interested when and very happy when I actually find out that there is a term for this thing. And it uh, is even better now that we know that is acknowledged as a, a proper disorder. And uh, we know we are not alone. So spreading awareness about misophonia is very, very, very important because it does affect a large number 
of people, a huge amount of the population. I just think it's very important to spread awareness for misophonia because it's extremely difficult with a, for a person who experiences the trigger uh, to look at the person that sits next to them and say, please stop eating that apple uh, right now because you feel like you are a bad person or a weirdo and things like that. Whereas I believe when, uh, when uh, there will be uh, awareness of misophonia, people can simply say, oh, uh, you know, I'm misophonic, still a wonderful person, just misophonic. Uh, so I really get triggered by the apple. And the other person will say, yeah, you're still a lovely person. You just can take my apple eating. That's fine. That's not off offensive or anything. And that will improve uh, people's lives so, so much. And even people um, can understand why the, some people respond the way they do. So awareness is very important. Awareness also includes um, talking to health professionals because at the moment the people with misophonia are absolutely the experts in this disorder and so they have to be the ones that are talking to their health professionals and educating them which is a really intimidating hard thing to do but the more our health professionals hear about it the more they'll start paying attention that if enough people are talking about it they'll start to recognize it as something that actually does need help and so it can be a really hard thing to do but it's a really really important thing to do.